life is the life as God has it. There is no death in that life. When you believe the gospel, you are obeying the gospel. By doing so, you are obeying God. Your obedience to the instruction in the meeting is what connects you to the flow of the spirit in the meeting. It's what connects you to the flow of the anointing in the meeting. Your prayer life is the temperature of your Christian life. Your faith must be in the law. The blood of Jesus is something the devil cannot stand. Romans 4, and we'll begin reading from verse 19. Romans chapter 4, we'll begin reading from verse 19. And be not weak in faith, speaking about Abraham, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, 20 says, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. 21, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And this shows you the possibility of growing stronger in faith and also the possibility of growing weak or even weaker in faith. And you see, it's important to notice, it is not really faith itself that can be weak or strong. It is actually the person, the believer, that can grow strong in faith or grow weak in faith. And again, the reason is because the things of God are perfect and faith is of God. Mark eleven twenty two. Jesus said, have faith in God. What he literally said was, have the faith of God. Have the faith of God. When you read in Galatians 2, 16, twice in that verse, put it on the screen, Paul Right into the Galatians spoke of the faith as the faith of God. He says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. Go to verse 20. So I want you to just see, it's the faith of God. Verse 20 says, I'm crucified with Christ. You see, nevertheless I live, yet not I but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. The faith of the Son of God. Somebody say the faith of the Son of God. Say it again. Say the faith of the Son of God is in me right now. Say it again. Say the faith of the Son of God is in me right now. So it is the faith of God. So it's in a perfect state. You see what I'm saying? It's just like the righteousness of God. You can't get a higher version of it you can't get a less quality version of righteousness because it is the righteousness of God you cannot be more righteous you cannot be less righteous you are just simply righteous he made him to be seen who knew no sin 2 Corinthians 5 21 that we might be made the righteousness of God in him so notice all these things in the new testament or new creation more precisely they are of God remember 2 Corinthians 5 from verse 17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Every time you see the phrase all things, especially in the New Testament writings, it is always qualified as in the context of what is being said, meaning all these things that we're talking about. Just say with Paul say in 1 Corinthians 3.20, Let no man glory in man, for all things are yours. He's not saying all things in the world are yours. At least for one, you know my wife is not yours. You better believe it. <laughs> say amen to that. Amen. Every time they say, you better know that my spouse is in yours. Uh, you know, because you know, some people jump around and say, all things are mine. All things are mine. My shoes are not yours, brother. <laughs> amen. <laughs> my shoes aren't yours. So he's talking in a context. For example, in the context of 1 Corinthians 3:20, Paul was talking about, he was talking about how there was division in the church. Some said I'm of Paul, some said I'm of Apostle. So when he said all things are yours. He went on to say it. Whether Christ, whether Paul, Apollos, all these are yours. They are your gifts. That's what he's saying. So he's not saying all things in the world are yours. Are you getting what I'm saying right now? So in the same way, when Paul spoke in 2 Corinthians 5, when he said that, Behold, all things have become new. He's talking about all things in the new creation. Then he went on in verse 18 and said, All things are of God. Now, notice again, all things there is also in the context. The brotel is not of God. 
Are you seeing this now? So when he says all things are of God, he said all things in this new creation are of God. Now, what are the things in the new creation? The righteousness. In Isaiah 54, 17, no weapon fashioned against you shall prosper. Every tongue that rises up against you in judgment, he said, you, not I. The Lord said, you will condemn them. Then he says, for this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. He says, for their righteousness is of me, saith God. So even Isaiah prophesied that the righteousness in the new creation is not of the man in Christ. It is of God who put that man there. So the righteousness is of God. The holiness is of God. Ephesians 4, 24. You see Paul talking about righteousness and true holiness. Let's go there quickly. Glory to Jesus. You've got to know what is yours. Faith will never walk with ignorance. And that you put on the new man which after God, Paul said, is created in righteousness and true holiness. You see, righteousness and true holiness there talks about is just like God. The same righteousness, the same holiness that God has. You see, righteousness sometimes was described as a robe. So, and the reason is because God is like God taking his jacket and putting it on you. So the righteousness I have is God's righteousness. Are you seeing this? Somebody go to Philippians 3 quickly. Glory to God. Somebody say, I love the word of God. I love the word of God. Oh, yeah. Somebody say, oh, yes. Oh, yes. And we're reading from verse 9. Philippians 2. And being found in him, not having my own righteousness. Look at that. Which is of the law. He said, but that which is through the faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith. E.W. can wrote a book, Two Kinds of Righteousness. This is what I'm saying now. There is your righteousness after the law and you are not even a Jew. You can't even speak about that one. This is what I'm saying now. But there is the righteousness of God. Now, the righteousness of God talks about God's own righteousness that he imputed to you. Imputed means he set it to the credit of your account. Put your name on it. It's like somebody paying cash into your account. The money is now in your name. So this righteousness is now in your name. So you can say, you can say, Shew or Jekola the righteous. Oh, yes. The same thing with his holiness. And how do I know about the holiness? Hebrews 3.1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. The word partakers means share out of it. Second Peter 1.4. Partakers of the divine nature. So when, when you stand and God stands, the righteousness in him is the same righteousness he sees in you. The holiness in him is the same holiness that the same said you. Holiness simply means uncommon. It's rare. We are different species. <laughs> the rarity of God has been shared with us. So just as people can say there is none holy as the law, they can also say there is none holy as the church of Jesus Christ. Because we are his body. Members of his body, Ephesians 5.30, of his flesh and of his bones. Jesus looks at you and says concerning you, say, NS, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. That's what sees you. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. That is what Jesus says about you. That's what he says about me. Somebody shout to me and say, I'm bone of his bones and I'm flesh of his flesh. Shout amen if you believe somebody. The seed of glory to God. Did you see this now? And so, you understand therefore all these things are of him. So the righteousness, the holiness, and of course the faith. So you see, in the new creation, we didn't bring anything of our own. There's nothing of us that is in the new creation. Everything in the new creation is God's making. You see, so in the new creation, we didn't bring things there. We only came to obtain things there. Another thing in the new creation is the mercy of God. We didn't come with mercy. First Peter 2.10. He said, who were once without mercy, but now have obtained. Notice he didn't say we brought mercy. We didn't bring any mercy. But God who is rich in mercy. Ephesians 2, 4. God is the one who is rich in mercy. God is rich in mercy. For great love where he loved us. When we were dead in trespasses and sins. Quickened us together with Jesus Christ. So notice there that we didn't bring mercy. It was God who is rich in mercy. That actually gave mercy to us in Christ. So when we got into Christ, we obtained the mercy of God. The mercy of God is now mine. 
So notice that it's the mercy of God, it's the righteousness of God, it's the holiness of God, it's the faith of God. Of course, it's the power of God. It is the spirit of God. And you see this now. None of us. John 2, 9. Jonah said, I will, I will sacrifice unto you. He said, I will pay the vow that I vow. He said, salvation is of the Lord. It's not of man. In Christ, you didn't bring anything. You are not a contributor. There was no part you had in salvation. You only came to take part. To partake and to take your portion. That's all you did in salvation. So in Christ, righteousness was waiting for you. Holiness was waiting for you. Faith was waiting for you. Mercy was waiting for you. The spirit was given to you. The life, of course, was given to you. So you didn't bring anything to salvation. You just came to eat at the table. Salvation is God inviting man to feast at the table God prepared. And we're feasting at that table. And one of the things that he has given to us is his own faith. So, just like those other things, did you see righteousness, holiness, mercy, his spirit, for example, the Holy Ghost, you cannot have another Holy Ghost in addition to the one you have. It's the same Holy Ghost. But guess what? You can grow strong in spirit and you can wax weak in spirit. Do you remember Luke 2 40 speaking about John Baptist as a child? He said he waxed strong in spirit. So you can wax strong in spirit, you can't get a stronger Holy Ghost. Do you get it now? But you can grow strong in him and you can grow weak in him. It's the same thing with faith of God as well. You can grow faith strong in faith, you can grow weak in faith. But if I made a choice, the Bible says, be not weak in faith. Did you see this now? So you got to make a choice. I'm not going to grow weak in faith. I will grow strong in faith. Stronger as a matter of fact. In faith. And I'm going to show you this morning because one of the ways to grow stronger in faith is by speaking. One of the ways to grow stronger in faith is by speaking. Mark 11 verse 23. Like I said, so it's like Kenneth Hague 11. But he quoted it so much you probably thought that he wrote it. And uh, Emmanuel Markankins will say that again, deliver me from the fear of repetition. So I can repeat myself over and over again. Mark 11, 23, Jesus speaking said, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall say to his mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Notice, he said, Whosoever shall say to this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. The word doubt there is the Greek word diakrino. And I'm going to dwell on it a little bit this morning. Because many times when you see a believer saying, I said it, but I didn't see it. This is why. Jesus didn't just say, say it. He said, after saying it, don't doubt in your heart. Don't doubt in your heart. The word diacrino there means to hesitate. It means to withdraw. So in other words, it's like you started a process, then you just pulled back. You said it, but then it was as though you took back your words. He said, shall not doubt, shall not hesitate. So in other words, he's saying, stop being hesitant. Stop being hesitant. And I'm going to just read out a few things about this to you. I'm going to read out from the Greek dictionary. The word is diacrino. Number one, it means to hesitate. Number two, it means to separate. You know what Jesus is saying? When you speak, don't detach yourself from what you just said. Don't detach from what you said. The word again, diacrino, means to oppose. It means to oppose. Again, the word it means to stagger. To stagger. Now, that's the word Paul used in Romans 4.20 about Abraham. He staggered not. That is, he diacrinoed not. And like I always like to say, just like you have astronaut, Abraham was a stagger not. He staggered not. In other words, Abraham did not separate himself from what he heard from the Lord. That he believed. That he started saying. He didn't separate himself from it. Because usually when you're believing God for something, you receive the word. You see, those contradictions that come against you, 
their goal is to detach you from that world. Is to separate you. In fact, the word diakinum is to separate thoroughly. That is, to separate in such a way that look, there will be no meeting point again. So Jesus said, Whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not separate from those words. Shall not hesitate. Do you see this now? Shall not pull back or withdraw those words. Shall not detach himself. Because sometimes you've spoken to the mountain and the mountain is still standing as though there is no impact on it. In spite of that mountain still standing, he's saying, don't detach from what you said. And there are many ways you can detach from what you said. It starts from your heart. Beginning with no expectation anymore. When you spoke words by the Holy Ghost concerning a matter, and because you have not seen any impact yet, then your heart begins to grow weary in expectation and you're like, well, 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 maybe it's not going to work. Maybe it's not going to work. What are you doing? You're already detaching. And that's why he said, shall not doubt in his heart because that is where it really happens. That's where it really happens. In other words, when you speak words, send your heart after your words. And let your heart keep following those words. How does your heart continue to follow your words? Expectation. I'm expecting to see what I say. I'm going to be looking out for it. I'm going to be checking whether it has arrived. I'm going to be checking my email. I'm going to be checking my, my bank alerts. I'm going to be checking where that thing is meant to show up. And I will not detach my heart. Is somebody hear what I'm saying this morning? Don't detach your heart. I said don't detach your heart. It's going to happen. <laughs> I said it's going to happen. Come on, I said it's going to happen. Sit down, sit down, please. Glory to God. So he says, shall not doubt in his heart. And that's what we're looking at. That is, shall not detach. That word diacrino, I just told you, the same word you see in Romans 4.20, speaking about Abraham, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. It's the same word diacrino you will find in James 1.6. Go to James 1. And you see in James 1.6, James is the Lord's brother in the flesh that is born James the son of Mary also the writer of this book of James notice now verse 6 but let's begin from verse 5 if any of you lack wisdom James said let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and obey it not we've explained this a lot of times and it shall be given him verse 6 but let him ask in faith look at that but let him ask in faith nothing wavering for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed the word wavering there is the same word diacrino did you see that let him not in other words be hesitant so notice he's saying this is what not to do after you have released faith so in other words after you release your faith don't now doubt don't doubt. After you set faith in motion, don't hesitate afterwards. Do not hesitate. Just the same way Jesus said in Mark 11, it's the same thing you see James also saying here. Jesus is saying, you've already spoken to the mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea. He said, but don't doubt after speaking. James is also saying, you lack wisdom, let, let him ask from God. After asking God, don't now what? Waver. Don't waver. Don't waver. Don't hesitate. Meaning, whatever you do from that point, let your body language align with what you just said. Come on, if somebody listen to what I'm saying this morning. Let your body language align with the words of your mouth. So Jesus says, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe. So if I don't doubt in my heart, what do I do in my heart? I must believe. I must believe. Believe what? Not just God's word. You must believe God's word quite all right. But Jesus didn't just say believe God's word. He said, but believe that those things which you said will come to pass. In other words, your words and your heart must remain connected. Your words and your heart must remain 
connected. Oh yeah. Are you saying this? Tell me about say faith works. But say my faith is working. Shout it out loud and say my faith is working. Woo! Sit down, sit down, sit down. You know I'm telling you, you're going to have, you're going to come into days where you see the things you once used to say. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. That experience is very sweet. When you are, you are living in the realities of the things that were once a confession. I just look at and say, thank you, Lord. Woo, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Be seated, be seated, be seated. So notice that. So he says, believe in your heart that those things which you say shall come to pass. Now, many times it's easy to believe what God said. But Jesus said, you must believe what you say. Now, it's easy to always just say, uh, I don't have mere words because you hear me say, but let me tell you, it's not a cliche. I don't have mere words because I have trained myself, now, not just as a minister, but even as a believer, I don't have mere words. And I'll tell you one of the secrets behind that is to train your heart and your mouth to always be in agreement. I'll repeat it again. Train your heart and your mouth to always be in agreement. Not only when you are confessing God's word as a lifestyle. As a lifestyle. It's the reason why I always teach. There, you see, Jesus spoke about idle words. He said, idle words stand against people. And you know how idle words stand against people? Idle words stand against people in the sense that by idle words, you are training your heart to disbelieve your mouth. Idle words are simply inoperative words. Words you don't mean. Slangs. Let me say, oh, is it that serious? Ah, is it, must it be that hard? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Slangs. If you want to use slangs, be careful not to use slangs that are idle words. Slangs that carry inoperative words. Slangs that make you say what you don't really mean. So, for example, she, she wakpa. Now, let me tell you what pa, what pa means. Pa means die. Now, I know it's easy for you, for people to just ask and say, show wakpa, and you say, mo wakpa, man, mo wakpa, man. But you know what? You know in your heart, you don't really mean as in die. As die, die. Uh-huh. Yeah, but the problem is, your heart wasn't designed that way. The moment you are saying something that you don't mean, your heart separates itself from it. But guess what? Even the day you now say what you mean, you have trained that heart to always detach from your mouth. So it will also not follow those words. That's the danger in it. That's the danger in it. And I tell you, you can ask me a million times and say, I will never say, I mean, never. You will never, you, you can put a gun to my head, I will never say it. I will never say what my heart does not mean. And I can see now, I'm getting in almost all of you now. The silence shows many are guilty. <laughs> you know, we live in a generation, people say the opposite of what they mean. Like, you go somewhere, the thing is so beautiful. And you hear people say, people say ah, oh, bad. And let me tell you something. Without knowing it, people don't realize Satan is always walking towards making you less effective in the supernatural. The devil walks at it actually. To render an entire generation almost like they are powerless. And notice what I said, almost like, because it is impossible for a believer to be powerless. The day will never come that you are powerless. It's not possible. You can't be a child of God and be powerless. As many as received him, John 1, 12, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. There is a power that comes with sons. It is irrevocable power. But you know what? That power can be rendered inoperative. And that's where the devil gets believers. You know, people even say stuff like, a prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. That's not true. It's not prayer that makes you powerful. A prayerless Christian is still a powerful Christian, but he will not experience that power in his life. Prayer only puts the power to work. 
Prayer doesn't put the power in us. Are you listening to me? Prayer doesn't put the power in us. Prayer only puts the power to walk. The effectual fervent prayer, James 5, 16. Confess your faults one to another. Did you see? Pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availed much. Amplify says, the continuous heartfelt sincere prayer of the believer makes tremendous power available. Dynamic in his working. The prayer didn't put the power in him. The prayer brought the power out of him. And channels it to where it is needed. So don't you ever look at yourself because you've not prayed for weeks and say, I'm now powerless. No, you're not. Start praying now. You will see power at work. You will see the power instantly. You, and instantly you will see the power, I'm telling you. The power is always present. Now unto him, Ephesians 3.20, who is able to do exceeded, abundantly, and far above all that which we ask or imagine according to the power that is at work in us. The power is there. The power of God in the believer is a token of love. It dashed us. It dashed it to us that salvation. Romans 1 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. So notice, it doesn't just save you, it is towards you. God, the moment you believe the gospel, he puts that power and he makes it to reside inside you. To the end, when Paul was praying for the Ephesians in Ephesians 1, he said that you may know, verse 19, the exceeding greatness of his power to us world who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand that power was not only able to raise him he was able to set him in his place that kind of power that can raise the dead and put him in his rightful place that power sets us in our position meaning if the devil tried to displace you by the vicissitudes of life that power can rearrange events and put you back in your position that power will rearrange event and restore you back to your place. Even if men try to scheme you out of your place, no matter how they divide it, no matter how they shake, their lies are falling out of me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. Oh yes. And that power is with us now. It is no longer coming from heaven above. It has been put inside us forever. Forever. <laughs> forever. Thank you, Jesus. You see that? As I Romans 5, when you see Romans 5 17 saying, Those who have received the bonus of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life. How do you reign? You can't reign without power. He's saying we reign in life because He has given us power to reign. Are you seeing this somebody right now? So, what Satan works hard time, over time, to render the believer inoperative in the supernatural. And one of the ways is through idle words. You cannot release supernatural power without the connection of your mouth and your heart. It's not possible. It can never happen. I mean, never. You see, the spiritual realm does not answer to mere words. No. Hey, anybody just talk anyhow, then it's not going to happen. Lie, lie, it doesn't happen that way. That's why you see, whenever Jesus said something in the, in the four gospels as recorded during his earthly ministry, he meant everything he said. And those things happened. Because he knew what he was saying. And that's what he was teaching in, in Mark 11. Because when he spoke those words in Mark eleven fourteen 14 to the fig tree, nine words, no man eat food from thee for forever, nine words, he meant everything he said. And notice in verse 20, it was Peter who called the attention of Jesus. Jesus didn't have to look at the tree because the moment he said those words, he knew power had gone towards them to accomplish what he said. So in explaining to them how this thing works, he now said what he said in verse 23. That this is the way it works. If you will say to the mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea. Those are specific instructions. And shall not doubt in your heart, but shall believe that those things you say shall come to you. You shall have whatsoever you say. That's, he said whatsoever. In other words, this is going to work on anything. But beware of idle words. So don't say, well, we're just joking. We're not praying. You know, it's just a joke. It's bad. It's bad. It's wicked. It's wicked. No, no, no. Use bad for what is bad. Use good for what is good. Separate things. Don't mixing things up. In the realms of the spirit, there are no jokes. 
There is no comedy in the spirit. There's no comedy in the spirit. Angels don't laugh at jokes. Now, nah, here, here is a bad, oh bad guy. Like, hey, hey. They don't find it funny. They do not find it funny. You see, because your heart has been designed by God to believe what he hears consistently. So don't train your heart to be discordant. To see good as bad and bad as good. That is what is actually described as wickedness. The word wickedness is from the word weaker. You know that thing they use in the, in the lantern? Yeah. Twisted, in other words. Don't twist your heart. A twisted heart becomes inoperative in the spirit. Can't achieve anything. Can't go after words of faith. Let your heart remain tender in the spirit. Mean what you say. Keep wrong words out of your mouth. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. Who has not lifted up his hands unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. It is a deceitful swing when you are saying what your heart doesn't mean. Therefore, he said you can't stand in the spirit realm. To stand simply means it's a posture of authority. It's a posture of authority. By faith, you stand. 1 Corinthians 1 24. I mean, 2 Corinthians 1 24. Not that we have dominion over your faith. But I help us of your joy, for by faith you stand. So if you stand by faith, your mouth and your heart must always agree. And it's a choice you've got to make today. No more inoperative words. No more. No more. Mom will tell you, we don't talk like that. We don't speak like that. Sometimes we come around some people who talk like that. You know, sometimes even people who are superior to us in the ministry. Sometimes you know, people just say some things, we just keep quiet. I'm not going to repeat after you that, no. I'm not going to say those kind of things. You've got to make up your mind. Sanctify your lips. You know, in Isaiah 6, when Isaiah saw the Lord in the temple, the first thing he said, he said, woe unto me, or woe is me. He said, for I'm a man of unclean lips. And the first thing the angel of God came to do was to clean his lips. You need to sanctify your words. Sanctify your words. Let your words be hallowed unto God. Let your words be hallowed unto the Lord. Don't let wrong words proceed out of your mouth. Go to Colossians 4, somebody. Glory to God. Oh, are you being blessed for Oh yeah, you sound like people who are repenting. And that was a good thing, you know. Glory to God. Some of you wonder, that, how come you say and it happens? I'm telling you now, how? You know, before I pray, I would say, when you get into a situation as a believer, and even as a minister, they're always going to say, ah, sir, blah, 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 we need you to pray. I don't just rush to pray. I want to hear God first. Because you see, faith is not about me just saying what I like. Faith is about saying what I heard from the Lord. That's what faith is about. It's about saying what I heard from the Lord. And that's the reason why we, we don't want to use words that contradict what is already written in God's word. You see what I'm saying? Don't let your words be stouted or stout against God. Like your, word are, your words are fighting God's words. Your words are meant to be in agreement with him. Not in opposition to him. Because if your words oppose God, who is then going to help you? Satan, he's not going to help you. He wants to kill you. He's saying this now. Colossians 4, 6. He says, let your speech be always grace. Seasoned with salt. Are you seeing this now? That ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. So in other words, they say show walk back, you must know how to answer that. <laughs> I'm blessed. <laughs> Glory. You know, when I first came to Lagos, one of our dear friends you know, came visiting and he asked my kids, say, How are you, David? And he said, I'm blessed. He was like, Yeah, I never heard this one before. Blessed? Oh, yes. Fine is not as good as blessed. And we're not just trying to be religious minded people. Every time we say it, we mean it. How are you? I'm blessed. <laughs> so blessed that even blessed people call me blessed. <laughs> and when a blessed man sees me, he looks at me. He says, man, this one blessed. This person passed blessing. This person, he passed blessing. <laughs> He's almost like a tongue twister. Blessing, past blessing. <laughs> so it's not a cliche. We don't reduce it to a greeting. I'm really blessed, actually. Really blessed. Really blessed. Let me see that. What a blessing. 
Oh yeah, I'm so blessed. And that's why, for example, when we make the declarations that we do during our giving as a church, that, you know, sometimes you need to see yourself and think about it. When we started making these declarations, try and imagine, those of you who have been members, imagine where we were. And look at where we are now. And now, judge, you, you did the judge. Can't you see these words are working? When we, when we started saying these words, we didn't want the venue. We were looking for venue. But we kept saying, we're getting our buildings, we're getting our lands, we're getting our houses, we're getting our vehicles, we're getting our equipment. Glory to God. Everything we need to enjoy life. To do it and to enjoy life. And after a godly sword and for a great weakness. Look around you. Look around you. <laughs> and you look around you, can't you see it? And this is just the beginning. <laughs> Look how people are getting jobs, promotions. You know, be seated, be seated, please. You know, one of the sons in the house here, you know, was serving last week Sunday. You know, last year, I kept saying the last four months of 2023, prepare, use it to build capacity because in 2024, opportunities will be coming to you. And they're asking him to take a role in a bank, he's a banker, to take a role in a bank that is four steps ahead of his level. So the challenge right now is, ah, this is a lot. Will I be able to do it? And as he was saying, I said, that's the word of the Lord that came. It has caught up with you. It has caught up with you. So I said, go ahead. Just grow into it. That's all you need to do. Because the word always works. And I love the way Jesus answered them in Mark 11. Jesus didn't make it look like this is only meant for people like us. You earthlings, you can't deal with this. No. Jesus, I told you, is an example to the believer that whatever was possible to him is possible to us too. So in other words, Jesus is saying, I want you to live a supernatural life where you experience things that you say with your mouth. Where you can cause things to be by saying them. Because I tell you, the way God designed human existence is for your experiences to be dictated and shaped by your words. I'll say that again. The way God designed human existence is that our experiences ought to be shaped by what we say. That's the way God designed human existence. God didn't design it to just happen, that things just happen to you anyhow. No, no, no. The way God designed it is for man's experience to be shaped by his own words that what you are saying literally is meant to dictate the course of your life and I'm not talking about positive speaking here I'm talking about the supernatural you say but what about people who don't know these things well their life is going according to what the devil wants it to be what about those who don't speak right their life is going how the devil wants it to be the supernatural in the divine does not happen by chance it has to be deliberate. It has to be deliberate. So you've got to be schooled in speaking. Schooled in speaking God's word. In Job 22, and I'm going to show you this because sometimes people easily pounce on Job 22, 28, and thou also shall decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee, and light shall shine on your path. But before he got there, it tells you what you must do first. Job 22, let's start from verse 21. Acquit now yourself with him, and so shall good come. He said, I pray now with him and be at peace. And so shall good come unto thee. Verse 22, he said, Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth and lay up his words in thine heart. Can you see this? Then he says, and I want you to first pause with this. He says, Receive the law from his mouth. What does the word of God say about the words from his mouth? Deuteronomy 8, 3. Jesus also quoted it in Matthew 4, 4 and Luke 4, 4. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded forth out of the mouth of God shall man live. So back in Job 22, 22, he says, receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth. The law from his mouth, don't forget, he's saying the word from his mouth. You know why? Because the word of God is law. It is binding. Psalm 119 verse 89, forever, O Lord, your word is settled. 
I, you know, some people say things, things like, and they even sing it, say, and God said it, I believe it, I said it. No, 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 no. God said it, I said it. Whether you believe or not, that's your problem. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. When you believe it, it now becomes portion. You don't believe it, you are counted out of it. Your believing doesn't settle God's word. God's word is settled. That's what the Bible says. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And it is settled for life. When I believe it, it settles me. Yes. If I don't believe it, then, you know, but you want it to settle you too, then you believe it. Your believing brings you into it. Your believing doesn't affect whether it works or not. Are you seeing this? Romans 3, 3 and 4. Let God be true and every man in life. He said, shall the unbelief of some make the faith of none effect? He said, God forbid it. God forbid it. In other words, whether a man chooses to believe or not doesn't affect God's word. God's word in and of itself is sufficient. It carries the power to fulfill itself. Your faith in the word doesn't make the word work. It only makes it work in your own case. It's like your faith gives allowance to the word to do and manifest its ability in your life. The word is able by itself. Hebrews 4.12 The word of God is quick and powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. So it doesn't need you to make it work. You only believe so it can be allowed to work in your own case. Is somebody getting this right now? You say, receive the law from his mouth. He said, I pray thee. It's like, it's like appealing to you. Making an appeal. I pray you, receive the word from his mouth. Receive the word from his mouth. Because that is how man lives. By every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God shall man live. But how does he live? Is that what he brings you to in verse 28? Thou shalt also decree a thing. What thing will you decree? What you receive from his mouth? Not what is in your head. Receive the law from his mouth and let the law of God be your law for life. Take what you heard from God's mouth and put it on your own lips. You see, when God speaks from his mouth, he's expecting that word to be heard from your own mouth too. Oh, you somebody hear what I'm saying? Rahab Bonke used to call it mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. It's like God putting his mouth on your mouth and he's breathing into it. <sighs> and you also receive it and inhale it. <sighs> then you exhale it back on whatever you want it to work on. I will say of the Lord, Psalm 107 verse 2, let the redeemer of the Lord say so. Psalm 91 verse 2, I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge, he's my fortress, he's my God, in whom will I trust? I will say of the Lord, I will say of the Lord, I will say of the Lord. Say of the Lord simply means, I will say what I heard from the Lord. I will say what the Lord said. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, let your conversation, that is your manner of life, be without covetousness. But be ye content with what things ever ye have. For he has said... I will never leave you nor forsake you that we may say what he said for one purpose so that we can say it also. Yes, Let them shout for joy and favor my righteous horse. Let them say continually. Let the Lord be magnified. We take a pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. 37, 25. Are you seeing somebody? That's the word of the Lord. Yeah. Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, not once in a while, continually. Yeah. Hebrews 13, 15 by him. Therefore, let us offer sacrifice of praises continually. Continually is another way of saying as a lifestyle. As a lifestyle. Let God's word be the words you're saying. Let it regulate your life. In your conversations, don't say things that contradict the word. I'm not saying you start speaking in King James everywhere you go. I'm simply saying let the word of God guide what you say. So when something is going to contradict what the word says, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to agree to that. I don't find that in God's word. Please see that. They say, they say everybody is just crazy in Nigeria. Not me. Not me. I'm not crazy. Please see that. I know, I know, I know you will speak the word. He said, the way this country is going, the way this country is going, eh, it will finish all of this. He can't finish me. And, and I've seen people who are also you know, very funny, and they will say things like, hey, you know, all you faith people, you'll be talking faith, you don't even have human compassion. Ah, organized okay, compassion. Well, how did my compassion stop? Because I'm saying what I don't want. I'm, I'm saying what I want in my own life. So, compassion is for me to now say what I don't want to see in my life, to join you, to associate with you. No, now, I will care for the poor, but before I can care for the poor, I need to be all right. This I'm saying will put the position to help the poor. You don't help the poor by confessing what the poor is confessing. That's why they are the place right there now. Most of them. And I say, hey, I say, if no matter how bad the economy, I will prosper. What should I say? That I will follow the economy to rumble. To please you. 
No, sir. Not me. <laughs> he said, the country is very bad. You know, see, I tell you, you don't even want to allow it in your environment. When, when, when I graduated from the university, uh, the year I graduated, a few of my friends, we all stayed back for ministry purposes. And I'll never forget, uh, I stayed in one house on, you know, Ede Road in Ife, just by Campus Gate. And one of my dear friends were staying together. And I'll never forget, he had a neighbor. I was quoting with him. I was once his quarter. Believe me, at one, at one point, where I got my own place, I was once his quarter. Let the brother of low degree rejoice. James 1 9. <laughs> You see what I'm saying? And I'll tell you, and this neighbor of my friend had this habit of playing one song every morning. Crazy song. Fool do no day. Lord, I know day. Some people know the song. Our government no good oh. That's how I know this. You see, I can still remember this song. But it meant my consciousness. <laughs> and I'll tell you, morning after morning, I say 50 past four, say morning after morning, he my head to hear as he landed. Not to hear this nonsense. <laughs> Not to hear this rubbish that this guy is playing. So I told him, this guy will put us into trouble. <laughs> if we keep hearing this early in the morning, one day there will be no food in this house. <laughs> so I said, let's agree. That speaker will bust. <laughs> we suddenly woke up one day, we didn't hear it again. God delivered me. Because you can't be waking up into that kind of atmosphere and it won't affect you. Except for one thing, you must now say your own words. So as the guy would, before the speaker boss, as he would rise up in the morning and play the song and the speaker is blasting, fool, do not day. I get up and say, my God supplies all my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Glory to God, my needs are met. Ah, fool, do not day, care. Fool must do. <laughs> and this guy, I'll never forget, his name is Agbara. This guy that is playing fool, no day, he needed to go and fish when it rains for him to get protein. Wow. So did you see that food no day was affecting his destiny? Yeah. I'm telling you. It was affecting his life without him knowing it. Because again, there are no jokes in the spirit. There's no comedy in the spirit. None whatsoever. Sometimes it can be so serious. We had a convention with my spiritual parents about a year ago. And one of his friends, these are people who have been in ministry for over 40 years, and he was narrating a story of one madman that he ministered to years back. And he said, you know, one brother in that story, you know, he, he said he impregnated the woman. So when he got to that point, he said, the guy said, I impregnated. He said, no, he, not me. I don't want to call rubbish to myself. I said, even in illustration, the man is conscious of his words. He's conscious of his words. And that is where I want you to get to. Be conscious of your words. You know why? When you get that serious and conscious of your words, they will walk. Yes, oh yes, I'm telling you, they're going to walk. They are going to walk. When you come to that point where you are so conscious at all times of what is coming out of your mouth, what you are agreeing to, then you will start seeing the supernatural. I tell you until then, it will be a far, far, far fetched thing. But the moment you begin to speak it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Every word of my mouth. I see the psalmist praying and said, Let the word of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you, O Lord God. Because you see, these men of old they sanctified their words unto God. Look at the life of Jesus Christ. Jesus had no inoperative words. There was never a time Jesus said something and said, No, I was just looking, I didn't mean it. Not our Lord Jesus Christ. Not our Lord. You remember when Jesus Christ told them in John 2, he said, where can we get bread that we may feed these people? You know, really, you probably have thought that mm, he didn't mean it, Joe. Uh, maybe Jesus is joking. No, he's not joking. So maybe they thought it was just some prank. He wasn't pranking them. He meant to feed those people. The moment he began with that question, where may we find bread to feed these people? He set the supernatural emotion immediately. And guess what? When they began to give him estimation, that didn't make him detach from what he had said. He followed through with it. He said, all we have here is just seven, five loaves and two fish. Normally to the mind, at that point, a person would have just felt like, wow, five loaves, two fish, <laughs> these thousands of people. Guys, najoku, najoku. Uh, Abba, I go feed these people. I beg, I beg. Send them to their houses. Oh no. He followed through with the process. Sometimes, 
you already embarked on the project before you found out how much it will cost. And you already declared we're going to do it. Don't back down. Don't back down. There is a miracle somewhere along the line. There's a miracle somewhere along the line. There's a miracle. Jesus didn't back down. What did he say? Make them sit down. Make them sit down. What multiplied the five loaves and two fish were the words from his mouth. Because the five loaves and two fish were made by those words. Anything the word made answers to the word. Anything. I repeat it. Anything made by the word continues to answer to the word. Anything. Anything. So the words Jesus spoke at the beginning of that operation was to feed the people. So the people must be fed. <laughs> they must be fed. They must be fed. No matter how many they are, they must be fed. And not only were they fed, they were, they were filled. They ate their fill, each one. Until they were leftovers gathered. Fragments were gathered. Look at that. From what didn't look like enough to having more than enough. Because he spoke those words. He spoke those words. Beloved, God designed for human existence to be shaped by what we say. And what we say must be what we heard from the Lord. That means what is written in the Bible. One. Then number two, what the Holy Ghost ministers to you per time or specific areas of your life. There are matters of your life where specifics are concerned that you will not find in scriptures. You will not find in scriptures, thou shalt go to America in 2024. But you know the Holy Ghost can tell you whether you should go to America in 2024. And if he told you that, no matter what the obstacles look like, you will get to America. Is somebody hear what I'm saying right now? So this morning, I want you to lift your hands. You're going to just worship the Lord. You're going to bless his name. You're going to bless his name. God will impress things in your spirit this morning, beloved. Some of you, words that you were disengaging yourself from before, you will attach yourself back to those words now. Open your mouth now. Just worship him first of all. In the next two, three minutes, let's just worship the Lord. Bless him. Some of you, you have words you want to retract. In this moment, this sacred moment, be able to do it. Go ahead. Worship him now, somebody.